Hello, everyone. Welcome to virtual ear training for the large ensemble with Ryan Keberly. Uh, my name is Jesse Nolan, and I'm the membership manager here at the Jazz Education Network. We're delighted to have all of you with us today. Um, before I pass it along to Ryan, I just want to let everyone know that in the description of this uh, live stream video is a link to register. If you would click on that and register, you'll be receiving an email after this session is over with a link to download the handout that Ryan has prepared for this session. Um, and you can also uh, register there and get a link to submit some questions for Ryan. We've got a lot of questions. Ryan is going to uh, talk and, and deliver his material and then we're gonna segue into a Q&A. But if you have additional questions that you'd like to answer, please feel free to submit them in the comments of this video. We'll be monitoring those as well. As always, we'd encourage you to join the Jazz Education Network. Uh, we have a lot of great membership benefits and there's a link in the description of this video to join our organization as well. So please check us out. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a, a man uh, who is hailed by Downbeat as one of the number one rising star trombonists. Uh, he is also uh, an, a jazz educator of note and uh, has very graciously agreed to share um, some very pertinent information with us today about how you can build better musicians in your large ensembles uh, by doing ear training during this time when we're all working virtually. Uh, so without further ado, Ryan, this is Ryan Keberly. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for everyone uh, tuning in. And um, uh, we obviously find ourselves in a, in a unique time, a, 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 a moment in history which has really never uh, been replicated before. And, um, you know, we're all kind of just finding our own ways. And, and that's exciting, but it's obviously extremely daunting and can be extremely frustrating as well, especially when technology is involved. Um, and I certainly don't have all the answers. Uh, I have some answers that I've found to have worked for me. I am the Director of Jazz Studies at Hunter College, which is one of uh, the City University of New York uh, public universities in Manhattan. I've been there for about 16 years now. And uh, I run all things jazz related, but of course ensembles are, are the bread and butter of what I do and so many of us do in jazz education. And um, when we went to a uh, quarantine lockdown over a month ago, our lives were flipped upside down. And our ensemble classes in particular um, had to overnight shift and completely change the, really in every way, shape or form, not only how we run them virtually, but our, what, are we, what are we looking to achieve now? How can we achieve that? Um, and so what I'm going to do today is just look at some of the techniques that I've found to, to, to work and to be of benefit to my students and also to me as an educator. I've learned a lot over the last six weeks uh, as to what, it, what, it, what is most important when it comes to music education. Um, I think we're all very much aware of the importance of listening, but usually when you have 30 to 60 minutes to run a rehearsal, you know, you might listen to uh, a reference recording before beginning a new piece. Maybe you listen to it a few times uh, thereafter, but you use the most, the majority of that time, obviously, to play and, and to, especially with younger students, I mean, every minute on their instrument is such a valuable part of the process. And um, that playing now when we're all sitting in our uh, bedrooms by ourselves, uh, separated in some miles by, by really great distances. I'm about 90 miles away from my college. I'm sheltering in place up in the Catskills. So, um, you know, but even if you're on the, in the same neighborhood, um, the, these virtual connections just don't make it possible for us to play together. Um, there are just recently a few programs coming out that seem to make that possible, but they are fairly um, tech heavy in their requirements. And we could maybe touch on that at the very end of today, but that's really not what today is about. Today is about looking to find other uses of our time that will make our students better musicians and specifically better listeners. And so, you know, what's dawned on me over the years as an active performer as a professional musician is um, the fact that I hear things in music 
that other people don't. And I'm not just talking about amateur versus professional. I hear things that other professionals don't hear and vice versa. And certainly when it comes to our students, we as experienced music listeners hear so many details in the music that our students absolutely don't hear. And um, I think that the, the, and I think we're all aware of that, but just how beneficial it can be to get our students to start hearing in more detail and more focused ways. I'm finding um, this quarantine, this, this, this life in quarantine has really opened my eyes as to how that could perhaps be even more useful for our students in learning uh, music of all languages, not just jazz language or large ensemble language, all musical languages. Um, as compared to playing their instrument, because really, especially for younger performers, even for more advanced performers, when you're playing your instrument, your, your listening faculties are diminished because if nothing else, you're just shifting your focus to other things. And you really don't truly hear the most detail unless 100% of your focus is on the listening experience. And so that's hard to do when you've got an instrument in your hands and especially when that instrument is, is not that uh, easy for you as, as a young aspiring uh, music student might find. So, you know, one of the very first things that I did when we were shoved into this, this, new, um, this new world was do listening exercises with my students with their eyes closed and um, it's it's something we, you certainly could do also in in a classroom but um, I will share music with them and ask them to listen to it as they normally would and then we'll listen to it again with their eyes closed and I'll demonstrate that in just a second I, I should back up though and just talk briefly about um, technology and um, I'm trying to demonstrate actually not just for you but in my own um, in my own kind of musical life, educational life here in quarantine. I'm trying to do things as basic as possible. Um, I'm literally standing in a bedroom. I have no microphone set up, at least not plugged in. I do have a mic that I use to record professionally on, but I am speaking to you through my MacBook microphone and I am listening to you. If there was sound coming from your end on my MacBook speakers, there's no longer concern for feedback at least with new newer computers and phones, they've seemed to um, they seem to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> but there are, of course, some some basic technological things we should address. So the first is is technology platform, what to use. Um, when we first went down this path, our university was encouraging us to use the proprietary virtual learning software, which is called Blackboard. Every university has their own version of it, and most have had some kind of virtual learning. Um, um, software built into that for a while now. Um, but what we found almost immediately as a music department is that the, our, our ability to share audio was, uh, was is extremely limited. And I'm not talking about playing, I'm literally just talking about sharing music from, from a recording. And it, what essentially was happening is the music would come out of your computer speaker, which was already, of course, severely, severely um, diminished in quality. And then going back in through the computer speak the computer microphone and then coming out of your students computer speakers or headphones. So, you know, this chain was creating horrible, horrible sound quality. Um, and so what what we moved to shortly before the um, the um, the, the, the classes started back up was Zoom. And of course, Zoom does did have some security issues that uh, came up, but they seem to have been addressed in large part. And most of the security issues from what I've been told uh, stemmed from people sharing their links in a public setting. As long as your links don't go public, it would be extremely difficult for a hacker to come and Zoom bomb you as they, they've been doing. Um, so keep your links private. And I certainly haven't had any issues, nor have I had a, uh, heard of any stories of other people having issues when that is the case. So Zoom is, is pretty incredible, especially when you consider they didn't design it for musicians or music educators, because it allows you to share your audio in, in a multitude of ways. You can share your audio when playing from a YouTube video. You can share your audio when playing from Spotify or Apple Music. You can share your audio. Uh, essentially, any way you can play audio on your computer, you can share that audio and it goes directly from the internal sound card in your computer through the internet, internet and to your students' 
um, computer or phone speakers. So in, in other words, they're hearing exactly the same thing that you're hearing. Um, and that's a, that, that's a really big deal. I haven't found any other programs that are widely available and accessible that work on all platforms uh, that allow you to do that. Um, so I highly recommend Zoom as I share audio with you all today and demonstrate some of these, these practices. Um, I'm going to be using Zoom in that way. Again, just super, super basic. It's a free program. Uh, it works on all platforms as far as I'm aware. I haven't had any students that haven't been able to use Zoom, even students who have um, severe technological limitations. You're actually able to call into a Zoom class session if you don't have a computer or or smartphone or, or iPad, you can actually just call a phone number and, and, and stay tuned in uh, orally, uh, not visually, of course, but um, just over the phone. So pretty ex in, in, incredible program. Um, so I think I'll start though by a, a, just a couple of other important best practices when using Zoom in particular, um, and they are audio related. So I, again, I would encourage you just to use the built-in microphone and speaker on the computer seems to work great for most people, but Zoom does have a couple of um, built-in features you want to disable. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go to your audio settings and you want to uncheck the automatically adjust volume level. That's great when you're having a conversation uh, where there's a limited dynamic range, but when you're listening to music, especially creative music, classical jazz music, or playing an instrument with a huge dynamic range, that creates all sorts of problems. And you probably have experienced this if, you, if you've used FaceTime or Skype for private lessons because they do the same thing, except in those programs are much harder to disable, uh, where the sound volume is constantly jumping, jumping up and down. So in Zoom, you can disable the automatically adjust volume and you can set it yourself and you can find that sweet spot that works for both your voice and for the, the audio you're playing and for your instrument if you're demonstrating things on an instrument. So that's number one. Then when you go into the advanced settings of Zoom audio, there are two um, uh, settings. Both are uh, built to suppress background noise. So assuming you're working in a relatively quiet environment, you want to disable those because otherwise, again, they are essentially compressing and normalizing the audio unnecessarily. So disable both of those suppre automatically suppress audio features in the advanced audio settings. So with that all being said, uh, we are working in Zoom. We have our audio settings right other than that, though, it's extremely basic in terms of its technological requirements. And so back to my original kind of listening ex uh, uh, ex experiment that we did with my students, I shared some music. And one of the, the drags about this virtual learning environment for me is just how visually based it is, um, and in some ways unnecessarily. I mean, you all know as music educators and as musicians that uh, any stimulus coming in visually is going to diminish our ability to process orally. And um, of course, the, our students' generation um, are a generation that have literally lived their entire life with that visual stimulation. And I've personally found it to, to be extremely problematic. I find that generation of students are perhaps the worst listeners in the history of the human race. <laughs> They're great watchers of content and uh, it's, it's aesthetically, visually very sophisticated, but when it comes to their aural sophistication, uh, I find them to, to I, I feel bad for them. So that's what prompted me to do this first exercise. So I'm gonna share some audio. And um, when I do so, you're literally just gonna see a whiteboard and I do it this way. Actually, I'm gonna stop sharing, make sure I make sure I shared the audio in addition. I do this, here we go, so that there is nothing too visually stimulating because I'm gonna play my audio from Apple Music. Um, but rather than having the Apple Music program on the screen and those kids are staring at it and seeing what else you've been listening to, what's on your playlist and staring at the album cover drawings, now they've got nothing to look at. <laughs> and if uh, when we get into some, some dialogue here, you can also um, write on, the, on the, the whiteboard, right? And we can add notes as we go along. But the, the bottom line is we want as little to look at uh, to begin with as possible. And, and then we play some music. So we're gonna listen to a bit of music here. Uh, this is a song everyone probably knows. Um, we might come back to it for some of our other listening exercises later on. And um, I would ask them, let's just listen. This is not a song.
are going to say, I hear the melody and the rhythm section can say, oh, I hear the drums. And uh, they're all basically drawn to their respective instruments, right? That's normal. But then we say, okay, let's do it again. Let's close our eyes. And the other nice thing about Zoom is you can see everyone's face. That's also a really, really important uh, piece to it. I require all my students to show their faces. Um, so that I can see that they're engaged. It's not just a bunch of blank screens or, or names up. And I would play it again. I'd ask them, okay, now what do you hear with your eyes closed? And across the board, we had these revelations immediately um, of, oh, I've never, I've never heard, uh, I've never heard this or that. A horn player saying they heard the drum groove in a way they hadn't heard before and vice versa. Um, so in any case, uh, this, this is a really, a cool opportunity to just listen more and that's going to be kind of the direction we head um, today as we delve into more specific listening exercises but I would say start with just listening to music and have your students close their eyes and get them to talk about what they hear because one of the things that I've found to be true and I'm sure everyone in here has experienced this is the greatest music educators are not the greatest performers they're the greatest listeners and also the most eloquent uh, um, conveyors of what they listen to and what they what they hear and I think it's just a really good practice to get your students in the habit of thinking critically about what they experience orally and putting it into words and of course there's some things you can't put into words and that's the beauty of music that's the sophistication of, of the musical language but it's such a good practice just to get students of all ages and ourselves to think critically as we're listening in this more focused way. And so it really just starts by playing music and having the students close their eyes. And uh, I, had a, I had a comment just come in saying it was hard to hear me talk over the audio. That is one thing you need to figure out. Generally, I don't actually talk over the audio because it's, it sends a bad message to our students. Um, I only talk, I'll pause it, then I'll talk. But if you do have to talk over the audio, you can control the volume on your own playback and that also controls the volume coming through your students playback as well. Um, so with that being said and kind of laying the, the foundation of, of where we're at here. Um, and again, I'm no expert in this. Obviously, we're all figuring these things out. And if anyone tells you they're an expert in something they've only been dealing with for, you know, a handful of weeks, I certainly wouldn't trust them. And unless maybe they're the president of a major superpower, then of course, they know everything after a few weeks. Um, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, so we're going to jump into um, some, some sp more specific listening exercises. Um, and the first comes back to something I mentioned uh, that I observed after having my students listen with their eyes closed. And that was instrumentalists hearing other instruments that they themselves don't play in the recording. It's so interesting to think about how many people experience music on an extremely one-sided or lopsided way, myself included until I realized this years ago, you're always going to hear what you yourself perform what you yourself spend your time working on. So, you know, for most Americans, that's why lyrics are always the first thing they hear. They don't even hear music, they hear the words. Um, but for musicians, usually it's their instrument. They're drawn towards their instrument, or at least the role or register that their instrument functions within. So one of the things I love to do, and I get pretty specific about this with my, with my college students, is I get horn players to listen to and learn rhythm section parts and vice versa. So with that track, Stolen Moments, one of the first exercises we did over our first week of virtual classes was I asked my horn players to learn the bass line and I asked my rhythm section players to learn the melody. And it was unbelievably challenging for many of them. For many of the horn players, they couldn't even hear the bass. They, they heard the bass as just the lowest note in the harmony. And so maybe that has to do with the headphones are listening on and that's another, that's another conversation. But a lot of it just has to do literally with their ears not being trained to hear registers uh, frequencies that low. And I mean, so this is, you're literally physically making your students better listeners using this technique. And so horn section players, the assignment was for them to learn the bass line, no transcription, no notating of music just simply learn it on their instrument in the register that they're able to play it in, or worst case scenario, sing the bass line, and then for the rhythm section players to, to learn the melody. And for most of them, that was a little bit easier, but for your drummers to think in terms of pitch aside from rhythm can be challenging and of course also really rewarding. So that's a great place to start and very much tied into the first exercise of just kind of pure listening 
and uh, with, with general observations. Um, getting them to, to learn it on their instrument to me is the key here. The, the notation is something that I might do in a private lesson or maybe with a more advanced student, but it's not really necessary for what we're trying to accomplish here as an ensemble living in this virtual world. What we're trying to accomplish is heighten our students' ability to listen uh, in focused and critical ways, and then also translate these, these aural perceptions this newfound experience that they're, that they're having orally onto their instrument. And of course, still trying to get them to play their instrument in most of these listening exercises. Um, so that's also very important to me. Um, so we're gonna go on the next, um, next exercise that I began to explore. Um, and this, I'm giving you most of these in kind of the order that I uh, came to them. I mean, for me, like all, everyone out there, just kind of flying by the seat of our pants a month and a half ago, trying to figure out what to do with a class, um, what to do with a class uh, in, in where where your your intended target, your your uh, you know that is to get them to play their instruments, is kind of no longer possible. So. Um, the next step here is to um, listen to multiple versions of a song you're working on. So most of the material that I had my students listen to and still have them listen to are songs we were already working on in our um, ensemble rehearsals and or songs that we're currently working on. We have, I have introduced some new charts and we're learning them virtually. I'll get to that if we have time at the end. Um, but really trying to focus our listening in ways that draw on material that we're already familiar with. That's such an important piece to this, I think. Um, I mean, we're all more uh, readily adaptable to things that we're familiar with. You know, the known, the unknown is such a hard thing for, for people to jump into. Um, so for my band, my big band in Hunter, one of the songs we had just started practicing was the Billy Byers arrangement of all of me for the Count Basie Orchestra. And so, of course, we were listening to the original. We were learning it actually from the original. Um, but then it just so happens that there are some other versions of that song on YouTube, some live recordings. And this is the beauty of our age. I mean, for as, as devastating as the internet has been to music in some ways, live music, recorded music, and just our ability to listen to music, it does have a silver lining. And one of those is the accessibility to music and to uh, material that was never available even 15 years ago. So I just wanted to just briefly demonstrate not only how hip these live recordings are, but also how I used them in this listening exercise and also demonstrate the ability of Zoom to share the video and audio. So um, again, this is Count Basie's All of Me, the Billy Byers arrangement. And again, we were working from the original recording off of the Frankly Basie album. Uh, but now two different live versions from different periods of time that we're going to uh, draw from here. And uh, the first is, um, is the older of the two. And there's a lot of interesting visual cues here as well. I think the first time we did this, I did it without the screen being shared because again, I really try to, um, when we're working on listening exercises, I really try to do so without any visual stimulation. But um, since we're all, we're all professionals here, I wanna share the video as well, um, just because it's, it's super cool to see the Count Basie band playing this music for a live dancing audience. Um, okay, so this is one of the versions that is available on YouTube of the Count Basie band playing All of Me. And for those of you who know this song, think about how it compares musically. How, how does it compare to the original? Tempo, timbre, solos, um, swing groove, uh, so many other, you know, vibrato from the saxophone, specific articulation, phrasing issues, uh, or phrasing, phrasing approaches. Here we go. <laughs>
I'm going to stop it there. It's really hard for me to stop that. <laughs> oh, it's so good. So many unique things about that version as compared to the original and, that I'm hearing and that I think most of my students don't hear at all. Now, there are a few obvious things that are super cool, just things you'll, you'll happen upon. For instance, my guitarist all noticed immediately how clearly audible the Freddie Green track is on that, just the way they mix that live recording. The guitar is front and center. It's the loudest thing in the, in the mix. And usually in, in studio versions of, of the song, and for most bass C recordings, the guitar is really hard to hear. Um, so that's a great tool. It just so happened for my guitars to start getting deeper inside the Freddie Green comping approach in, in traditional big band swing music. Um, it's, it's incredible to be able to hear it that audibly. That's actually the best I've ever heard it. Um, so then let's compare that to another version, also a live version. Now, usually for a lot of the music we're working on, you're not going to find different live versions of the same band playing. And that's a really an ideal situation. But you could most likely, most probably find the same arrangement played by different bands. Maybe it's different um, pro professional bands. Uh, worst case scenario, you can probably find some other college bands playing these charts and compare their performances. Again, it's a matter of getting your students to hear, the not just hear, but listen in focused ways and then critically compute what they're hearing. And so this com compare and contrast is such a great way to do that. Um, so let's now listen to the other version of this, this same song, same band, uh, a few years later. This is now there a little bit, uh, well, the dancers are getting older. This is now 1965 and uh, there are not as many people dancing to this kind of music. So they are performing in a concert setting, which is also kind of interesting as a side note. Uh, and again, I would have played this just audio for the first few times we did these compare and contrast exercises. Here we go. <laughs> So after this compare and contrast, especially compared to the original, I'd have my students write notes, take notes. Uh, this would be an assignment on their own time. So asynchronous learning. We would have listened as a class at least a few times, but they would be asked to go and listen more on their own. Obviously, this kind of listening takes a lot of repetition, especially for um, people who aren't used to listening in this way. But so many differences. First of all, it's a different drummer on, the, uh, on, on some of the versions. So how does the drummer play the groove differently? Where does the groove lie? Where does the backbeat lie? Uh, one had hats, the, the earlier version, the horns were using hats and the second one they weren't. Uh, this just general sound quality, mixing things. You know, the, that version had more reverb than the previous version, whereas the studio version has a ton of reverb. 
And just hearing these kinds of details, which version has the shortest articulations? Um, Basie solo is different in each, which is also really interesting to hear. There's so many details you can get into uh, in a guided listening approach. Of course, I'm looking for my students to hear these things and they don't generally, but I help them, I point them out and we listen to them as, again as a class. And usually then they do with that, that guidance they start to hear those things. And these are new neurons. I don't, I'm not a scientist, so I can't say what's happening in the brain, but these are, these are new connections being formed. And once they're able to hear a baseline, once they're able to hear reverb in a different way, they now have that skill. And, and it, they are now better listeners. And with those kinds of improvements, they're going to be far greater musicians, not even really having touched their instrument. Uh, when we all come back and, and start making music together um, in, in, the, in the future. So that's a really fun exercise. And as you can tell, it's fun for the, the teacher as well, just getting to hear and explore kind of some, some new versions of these songs that, that uh, you love so much. Um, all right, I'm so, I'm so used to asking for questions. It's a very unusual situation for, for me to be in this one-sided demonstration here. So we will get to your questions though, and they can be related to any specific exercise I've outlined um, or more, more general questions uh, as well. So moving along. Um, all right, so another thing that's been nice to get into from this listening standpoint is improvisation. Again, I don't know about you guys, but for my large ensemble rehearsals, the bulk of our time is definitely not spent listening, it's spent playing, uh, that is in the classroom. And of that time spent playing, the, the large majority of it is spent rehearsing the notated music, um, just for better or for worse. But now that we aren't doing that as much, um, another thing that's been nice to talk about is improv. And the internet is just ripe with improvisational uh, practice tools that it wasn't uh, ripe with, let's say even 10, 15 years ago. And so um, there's a couple of different things that I've done when it comes to working on improvisation. Um, one thing would be to listen on a song like this, I'd have them learn some of the solo material by ear. Again, no transcription, no notating, that really is another set of skills that, I, that were not looking to get into right now, trying to stay as focused as possible on listening and playing. Um, but for instance, that bassy piano solo on the final example I showed was super hip, rhythmically, unbelievably sophisticated, drawing from all these triplet quarter note phrases. And I'm gonna get my students to try to play along with that. Now, I would even have a hard time writing that out, notating that out. It was extremely sophisticated rhythm. But when you're playing along with it, listening to it, it's doable. And, and other solos on the music you're listening to, there will be parts of the solo, at least, that your students can learn by ear. So as they're listening, have them focus on a, a spe specified section of the so improvised solo and have them learn that solo, all of them. It doesn't have to be on, on their instrument. That piano solo can be played by every instrument in their own respective registers, including the drums and have them play the solo rhythmically at least and kind of approximate the pitch on the different drums, uh, on the drum set. That's a really great tool, listening tool. Again, getting instruments to listen to instruments other than themselves is just in and of itself a great tool to get your trombonists listening to a piano and the solos a pianist is taking. I mean, that's, that's invaluable. That's one of the things that I really credit my solo career to is, is not just listening to trombonists uh, when I was an uh, aspiring uh, music student. Um, so again, just learning them by ear, the notation is, is secondary. Something else that I did as we're listening to the solo sections is having students of all instruments play along in various ways. So, and, and this, this, could, this could occur over the general recording. This wouldn't have to just occur over the solo sections, but um, something that, that another listening technique that is so valuable it, to instill into your students is to listen for song form. Even if you don't know a song's form visually or um, having memorized the, the, the chord progression, there, there is absolutely their ability to listen and start to even subconsciously figure out 
the structure of a tune and figure out when a new chorus starts, et cetera. So I'll, oftentimes I'll play a song that they've never heard and ask them when they think a chorus has elapsed. Uh, and then as the next solo takes place, when is the next chorus elapsed, um, et, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's one great tool. But specifically to the improvised solo moments, um, you can have your students on all instruments playing the roots of the chords uh, and give them a lead sheet and start with something very simple. Start with the blues. But this is a great exercise, not only for listening, but also just kind of for very basic um, theoretical exercises and start with a, a, one of the blueses you're working on in your repertoire and have your students play along on their instruments, just the roots of the chords to one of the soloists. And it's such a useful exercise for them to start to hear the, the harmony in that way for them to then also start to feel and think about song form and structure and how each chorus is repeating as the soloist takes multiple choruses or as it passes from solo to solo. And they can do this while you can do this synchronously, that is together in Zoom. Um, so one of the things I didn't mention that you'll experience very quickly, you probably already have, is you need to make sure all your students are muted. And Zoom has a great feature that you as the educator can set so that everyone is automatically muted. That is the default. And then when they want to say something, they just simply hold down the space bar and it unmutes them temporarily while they say something. Um, so as long as everyone's muted and as long as the audio is coming from you, from one single source, everyone's going to experience it roughly at the same pace. And even if they aren't, as long as they're muted, you're not going to get any discrepancies in time or lag because they're not hearing each other, nor are you hearing them. Now, of course, you're not getting to hear them. That's, that's not great. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But at least they're playing their instruments. They're together with their classmates and you. And there's a sense of community, even it's in this really weird, messed up virtual way that is created when they can play together. So this is a little bit trickier just logistically because for some students, um, they don't have their instruments with them right now or they require amplification they might not have access to or they're, they're in a house with other people or in an apartment building and they can't play loudly or at all. All those things, obviously you gotta figure out. And so the, at the worst, just worst case scenario, I have them sing, everyone can sing. That's definitely something we do a lot of um, right now is, is, is just vocalization, singing. And again, give them the, the roots. I would demonstrate it. I'd play a blues. Um, I could demonstrate it for it now. You demonstrate this for you now, but I have so much more I want to get to. I may not, I might move on, but play a blues, share your audio and play the roots along with the tune and then have them do the same for the next chorus. And, and I think you're going to find this is just an extremely valuable exercise. Um, for all instruments to do, not just your rhythm section instruments, all the instruments, including the horns and the vocalists as well, just singing, singing the roots, playing the roots. And you can guide them. If you want to play along while they're doing it, they'll hear you and they'll hear the re pre recorded uh, music that you're studying uh, simultaneously. And they'll hear it at the same time because it's all coming from one single source, your source. So that's a great. Um, kind of secondary listening and playing activity that we've been doing a lot of. And in fact, I've been doing that in my, my jazz improv class as well. Um, of course, the more advanced, so getting them to play the thirds and the sevenths of the chords along with a, with a, with a tune that we're working on, um, getting them to arpeggiate the chords uh, as they go by. Um, something else that's really cool about YouTube nowadays, I actually didn't know this. I don't, I don't go onto YouTube very often, uh, kind of against most audio slash video experiences. I just find it, for me personally, it just kind of sucks. Uh, not a fun way to experience music. Um, but one of the very cool things, let's say you're listening to something um, that, that's more up-tempo. Um, and I'm just going to use the same uh, example that I was using before, but let's say it was a faster piece and your students were having trouble staying, staying um, together, uh, keeping up with the tempo. Um, something you can do, I'm going to share my screen here again, go back to YouTube. Something you can do in YouTube is change the playback speed. So right now we were hearing that, of course, at normal playback speed, but 
you can go to three quarters playback speed. It's limited, the, the options, but now we can listen to that piano solo. And let's say it was a faster solo going by more quickly, then this would be really valuable. And now we can listen to it at three quarter speed and it gives us a little bit more opportunity to, to hear what's happening and to play along with it and to, um, to assimilate it. effect sounds when you start slowing things way down like that but that is also an extremely useful feature when we're using YouTube as a teaching tool here um, all right so let's keep moving along here our next exercise um, ah okay yeah so something I started doing more and more and we actually started learning all of me this way but usually I'll try to pick um, small group arrangements, just things that are a little bit easier to hear, not so dense in their arrangement. Uh, and that is to learn songs by ear. Since we're not really fully working on big band music, I mean, you can, and, and we are doing some of that, and I'll, I'll get to that later, but since that is just such, it looks so differently now, um, why, even with a big band, why limit ourselves to big band repertoire uh, when we're doing these listening exercises. Um, there's so much great jazz repertoire out there that is at the heart of defining our jazz language that isn't from the big band tradition that are certainly useful for our, our music students, our jazz students to listen to. So um, one of the, the earlier assignments we did was we started learning the tune Stolen Moments, which I played earlier today, um, by ear. And again, I mentioned how I had uh, the various instrumentalists like listening to instruments unlike the instrument they themselves play. But beyond that, we really learned this entire tune by ear. Again, no transcribing, no notating. Um, and, and in this scenario, having instruments focus on their respective instruments or instrumental roles. So I had the bass learn the, the bass line, the piano learn the piano, et cetera, et cetera. And there will always be subtle uh, variations that you have to find here. In this tune, you don't really hear the pianist at all during the head. Um, so I had the pianist learning the melody. I also had the pianist learning the bass line. There is no guitar, so I had the guitar learning the melody and also um, my more advanced guitars, having them get inside some of the, the harmony uh, of the melody. But um, for this exercise, it's really more of an asynchronous uh, uh, exercise. So I would post uh, the original Stolen Moments track, MP3, onto our class Blackboard site or share it via email. And again, getting them to work from just audio is so important. I don't want them using YouTube. That is the worst possible place for them to be getting their music. If they have Spotify accounts or Apple Music accounts, great, then they can use that if that's how they listen, but no visual stimulation here. It's just, it's not gonna go well, not gonna end well. Um, so I'd have them then attempt at least to learn these parts and we would do it very slowly. They, they found it to be quite difficult at first. So maybe just focusing on the first half of the form. We really just dealt with the melody for this exercise. We never really got um, into like a full performance of it because it is still at the end of the day, more of an ear training exercise. Um, so having them learn their respective parts by ear. And then again, I'd have them alternate, swap. I'd have the horns learn the rhythm parts and the rhythm section parts, rhythm section players learn the horn parts just so that they're continuing to listen to it in different ways. Um, for more advanced students, you could have the horns get into some of the harmony. And no, they're not gonna learn each harmony line perfectly, but getting your students to hear harmony underneath the lead melody line is uh, an extremely useful tool. As you all know, or especially those of you who've done a lot of transcribing, there's a certain aural skill to be able to kind of hone in on a specific frequency, especially when it's part of such a, a, a chaotic sound as most recorded jazz is to, to your non-experienced listeners. Um, so they, I found that to be a really useful exercise for my college students, getting them to try to hear some of those harmony parts. Uh, and then finally, I would have them record themselves. Once they're starting to feel good 
about learning their, their parts by ear. I had them record themselves and I had them email them to me. And, and I'm sure most of you are working in this way, having, you're probably spending more time listening to student recordings via email than you ever have or ever wanted to in your entire life. Um, and it's a lot of extra work and I've actually found a kind of a subtle workaround for me uh, that I'll share in just a moment. But listening, some of course got it better than others. And then on the next class when we met, uh, we share best practices. And for some students, it was just a matter of that. They didn't have the volume loud enough or they were listening to on a shitty pair of headphones. Uh, and, and, you know, it just, there were no bass frequencies there. So how could they learn the bass line? Um, but for others, students had really productive insights as to best practices, um, sharing those with their students or fellow students students. And then, of course, I'd also offer my guidance as well. So that can be a really fun exercise, just simply learning tunes by ear. Be strategic with the tunes you pick. They shouldn't be too fast. They shouldn't be too slow. They should be fairly diatonic, even for more advanced players. Um, you know, you probably don't want to learn Have You Met Miss Jones. You want to keep it to more, more basic uh, melodies that are not rhythmically too syncopated. Um, that don't have, uh, have too much uh, triplet eighth note or 16th note subdivision in them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that brings me to uh, kind of, those are all listening exercises specifically. But um, as I mentioned, I also have been still trying to incorporate as much playing as possible. And that started by, as I mentioned, by having my students record themselves and submitting MP3s as we went along. But that is a lot of work, especially if you have large ensembles. Uh, our symphony director um, at, at Hunter College has, you know, close to 100 students in his, in his ensemble. Our choir director has close to 200 students. Um, so, you know, there are some, some settings where that just isn't possible to sort through that many recordings. So, um, something I stumbled upon, just kind of haphazardly, but have been working from almost uh, almost uh, entirely now is an online program called Soundtrap. And uh, it's soundtrap.com. And it is essentially a collaborative online program, much like all the various Google applications are, Google Docs are, where everyone signs up for an account and then can collaboratively edit and work together. Only with Soundtrap, it's a recording software program. And it's very, very basic. I would say it's even more basic. Actually, it's a lot more basic than even GarageBand. And every student is capable now of using something like GarageBand. It's kind of that level of expertise, technologically speaking, is something that every you know, 25 year old and under is, is able to figure out very, very easily. So there have been no kind of technological limitations that I've come across. Um, you sign up for an account, it's free right now, they're making it free. Um, and as an educator, you add all of your students into your classroom. And once they're all added and they've all accepted your invitation, you now can collaborative, collaboratively work on recordings that are living online in the cloud that everyone can, can access. So the beauty of that, well, there's a number of great things for that. Number one, the students can work on it on their own time. When you're working asynchronously, that of course is really important because every student's on their own schedule and kind of have their own, uh, their own lives to, 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 to deal with right now. And in some cases, at least for our, our New York City students, that can be pretty intense. So they're able to do it when they have time to sit down and, and, and focus on making music. Um, it allows each other's, it, it allows the, the students to hear each other's work, which is very, very cool and has been a great learning tool. I have three guitarists in my big band and they're all kind of have different um, skill sets that they bring to the table. And so they're learning from each other in terms of best voicing practices. And in ways it's really hard to hear in a live room, just volume wise, but also when things are going by in real time, they're there and then they're not there. So when things are living in a recording software program, they're always there and they can go back and listen to it over and over again. Um, but most importantly, it's so much better for the teacher because you're not getting bombarded with hundreds of emails over the week uh, with MP3s attached to them. Instead, all the MP3s now live in Soundtrap and then I can go on shortly before our next class meeting and see how everyone's progress has, has been going. I can listen to them together or I can solo each track and listen to them individually. Um, 
So I think I'll just very, very quickly demonstrate uh, kind of the, the very basic um, um, elements of this, just so you guys can see how really easy and technologically simple this is. Um, so I'm going to share my screen one more time here, and it's going to take us to my Soundtrap uh, kind of homepage, and then we'll go from there. All right, so now everyone should be seeing my Soundtrap homepage. You can see what we're working on, Manteca and uh, the Kenny Garrett Sing a Song, a great arrangement that my dad did, uh, Dan Keberly. Um, we got some combos working on a Radiohead tune, Ladies of Tramp. So I started a new track, which is empty for, uh, for our purposes. And here we enter the studio. And I would invite all the students, of course, so they'd all have access. And you can upload your music in one of two ways. You can literally just drag and drop an mp3 you've already recorded. So let's say we're, there's a lot of different ways to use this. I'm going to show you one way I, I've, I've used this. So let's go back to the, the tune All of Me. And um, you can upload individual tracks of students, right, which is probably what most of you would do. But you can also upload uh, basically like a play along track. It could be a neighbor's all play along track. It could be, it could be a track you're working from. And so when we learned all of me, uh, at least for starters, we actually learned it by ear and um, much like we did with stolen moments, but instead of having everyone working on their own kind of at home with on, on their own time, I had them work within Soundtrap. And as they started getting it together, I had, I think this is us. Here we go, I'm just gonna drag it in here. So you can drag in a whole, any, any sound file. It, it accepts all different uh, formats. Could be an individual track, or in this case, I dragged in a whole reference track. And then I had them at home listen, of course, they were already listening, I had them play along. So when they were laying down their versions, their, their tracks from their, their music they were working from, they actually were playing with the Count Basie band, which was pretty cool. And again, there are some logistical issues they have to figure out. They've got to get the volume right in their headphones um, so that they can hear the track and then they can also play. But those are really useful skills. I mean, those are skills that every musician has to figure out when the, the first time they enter a recording studio. You know, most of our students are more technologically savvy than, than we may give them credit for. Um, so of course they do have to have headphones, but they can still just do this on their phone. They can literally just record on their phone. Every student I've come across is able to do that or into their computer. So they're listening, they're playing along, reading their chart and they're recording. And then when they're done, they take their MP3 recording. They would drag it up. They'd add a new track here. They drag it up. And after a couple of weeks, we had 16 tracks up there. Every part had been recorded and uploaded, including the rhythm section tracks. And then I deleted the original play along track and we were left with a kind of our version inspired by the original recording by the Basie band. So that was really cool. The other uh, option, which is not as ideal, but it is possible is to record directly into Soundtrap. There's a bunch of features, much like GarageBand, where you can record MIDI instruments. These are all different MIDI options, or you can also record using a microphone, which is what most of your students would do just on their, their phone or their computer. And again, if you're wearing headphones and then you can play along like I showed, the only challenge with that when you're recording directly into the, 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 the program is that when it um, finishes and uh, the track shows up here in, in, in the new track uh, uh, segment, it's, you, it's usually just slightly off in timing. And so then you've got to drag that track uh, and try to get it on, on back in alignment, which is not hard to do. You can use these magnifying glasses down here to zoom way, way in. And so you can really get specific as to where the track lines up. Uh, you can set a click down here. There's a tempo marking. You can turn the metronome on and off. Uh, so you could also do this just to a click track or to some kind of basic track, like maybe the, the teacher, the educator, I'm doing this now. Um, on another tune we're working on, maybe, maybe you lay down some kind of play along track or some kind of foundation, be it a MIDI bass line or some some synth drums, MIDI drums, and then have them start building it that way. But this is kind of a, the, the new normal for us now. We're still definitely doing our listening exercises. But what Soundtrap has allowed us to do is to start and make 
large ensemble music again. And of course it looks very, very different because it's generally, it, well, it is happening asynchronously. Every student has to do it on their own time. But there is a moment during our class time when we listen back to the finished product and observe and it the first few go around is pretty rough i mean there's a lot of logistical issues everyone's trying to figure out now but there there is an enjoyment level and a sense of community that was palpable and um, has really opened up some doors for us to collaboratively make music and uh, it it's so much better to have a platform like this that everyone can access on their own time as opposed to delegating those tasks to one student or worse, even worse, delegating them to yourself um, and having to build all these multi-track recordings on your own. And it's a great experience for your students to get to know these recording software programs if they don't already. So I would highly recommend checking out Soundtrap. It's, again, it's a, a, at the moment, it is a free program. And for educators, they will set up an account for you. Again, they'll kind of walk you through best practices to add all of your students. Uh, you have to use their email addresses to do that, but um, you can even keep those private, I believe. Um, although when the students create their account, they'll have to give some kind of email address. So it's not 100% private, but it's been, a, it's been a real game changer for us. Um, so I think we have a few minutes left. I might just touch on a couple of other um, more playing techniques that I've been doing. These are not so much listening techniques, although obviously anytime you play, you're listening. Um, one is call and response. And you could do this just singing or with instruments if your students do have their instruments. Um, and so I'll play a phrase and then I'll ask my students, of course, they're all muted to play the phrase back. Now, over time, as we're doing this, I will start to unmute them individually, one at a time. And when I do that, I can then, and everyone else in the room can hear them um, uh, play. And so I can, at the very least, provide a little bit of insight and feedback. But worst case scenario, even if you don't hear them play, they are playing and they're, they're using your, um, whatever you played as a reference. We'll do rhythmic exercises this way for my more advanced improv students. We'll, I'll play, you know, more complicated uh, phrases from the jazz language and then have them repeat it back to me. Um, you can also create a kind of telephone game where I'll play a phrase or some student will play, play a phrase and then we'll kind of go around the virtual classroom and have each person repeat that phrase but add their own uh, personal uh, idea to it, personalize it in some way. And then the next person has to repeat that phrase but add their own personal idea to it. So that's been fun. Um, and then another thing you can do back to uh, improvise solos is uh, basically just sing along with, with solos. Um, if there's a tune you've been listening to a lot and you want your students to learn one of the improvised solos, uh, as a class in Zoom, you can share the audio and then you can ask them, you can slow it down if you're using YouTube or there are also software programs that let you slow down music like the amazing Slow Downer, um, horrible name, amazing program. Um, and get your students to sing along and or play along if they're ready for that. Um, but you can do that as a group and they can do that together because as long as they're muted and the audio is coming from one source, you, it connects. It, it, that's the glue that ties everything together. Um, and then we'll also done kind of show and tell where I'll have students, um, if we're working, this is more of an improv exercise, but certainly could apply to, to ensemble rehearsals. Uh, if there's a tune you've been working on and working on some improv techniques on that tune. I'll have students um, improvise using their own play along tracks, uh, basically their own audio setup in, in their room. Most students have some kind of speaker set up that they can play iRealBook Pro or Abersol play along track and then improvise. And then the rest of the class is listening to them. That student who's performing is unmuted. Everyone else is muted. We're listening to them. And then we provide feedback, constructive feedback, criticism, positive and negative. And we'll go around the room and whoever is interested in sharing, again, kind of a show and tell quality to uh, that exercise. So um, I just laid a ton of information on you all. And as Jesse mentioned, um, we do have a, a PDF uh, that will be available for download that kind of summarizes these various techniques. But I am genuinely interested um, to hear about other techniques. And um, I'm not sure if we'll have time to get to that now because I know there's a lot of questions. 
Um, but certainly please stay in touch with me. I'm very easy to find on Facebook, on Instagram, Ryan Keberly, um, on Twitter, and my, my emails on my website, ryankeberly.com. So stay in touch. Let's, let's share best practices. Uh, we're all in this together. And um, although for some of you, depending on where you live, you know, we might be out of this come fall 2020. I'm at the moment not too confident uh, for our New York City uh, colleges and schools. So, um, you know, I'm starting to think more long term um, and, and starting to always hoping to, to find other ways to make the most of our of our current predicament. So um, we are now going to jump into some questions and I'm going to kind of turn it over to Jesse to um, to, to kind of lead this portion of the workshop. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Jesse. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Are you sick of me yet? No, not at all. Actually, we've got some good questions coming in on the Facebook feed right. and we've got some ones that were submitted in advance. And I think you touched on some of these, but uh, the audience is asking for some, I think, more specific information. Um, so let's jump in. Yeah. Um, you mentioned solo transcriptions uh, as an excellent way, you know, to, to develop uh, ear training. Um, do you have perhaps a few suggestions? The, the specific questions was, what are your top five transcriptions for beginning jazz musicians, like the ninth through 12th grade level? Okay. Wow, that's tough. And I... Um... I'll give you a few. I don't know if I have five. I, I've done very, very little with, with high school, middle, middle school and high school level students, but definitely Miles Davis' solo on So What? That's like number one um, from the album Kind of Blue. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of great Dexter Gordon solos that fall into that category. I think one of the things when it comes to finding accessible solos is being willing to work on excerpts from the solos because usually at some point these solos are going to develop in such a way that they might become unplayable but for the first chorus they might be much more accessible i find a lot of dexter gordon solos are like that one that i get into um, pretty regularly that is more or less playable with the exception of maybe one um one or two uh kind of bebop triplet based um licks is his solo on the tune index it's just a 12 bar blues uh, from his album Go. And a um, few others I love. It's not an easy solo, but it is playable. Uh, certainly by an, an advanced high school student would be Lester Young's solo on Lady Be Good. Of course, a story solo in jazz history, but also just a super fun solo. You know, a lot of these, and, and I should point out um, that for me as a professional musician who still learns improvised solos, I personally find it so much more beneficial to learn them by ear as opposed from a notated source and to learn them vocally before I even touch my instrument. If I start by ear and start using my voice, and that might be over a period of weeks where that goes on, and then turn to my instrument and or the notation process, I find it to be so much more valuable because the point of all this is to not get it down onto paper or to understand it or to study it. The point of it is to make it a part of our fluent musical language. And we all know how much time that takes. And, and, and if you've studied foreign languages, you know how hard that is and how diligent you have to be. So the, the learning by ear really kind of forces the issue and the vocalization allows us to get into ideas that even if they aren't playable on the instrument, you're still internalizing those ideas and making them a part of your, your vernacular musically. And someday you will be able to play those ideas and they're there. Um, so if I had to pick a few others, um, I love uh, uh, Louis Armstrong's solo on Cornet Chop Suey uh, from his very early Hot Fives and Hot Sevens records. Um, and you know, another great uh, soloist to turn, for, turn to for accessible solos is um, J.J. Johnson solos. Uh, the trombone being such a, 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 that's my instrument, so I can speak uh, in the first person. It's such a challenging instrument to play the bebop language, which is, you know, more or less what our language is still based on when it comes to jazz improvisation, um, that, that I find a lot of trombonists are great uh, instrumentalists to turn to when we're looking for more accessible solos. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, so I'm going to plug a resource actually right now because you're talking about some of the things that are there. Um, and and a few weeks ago, I think we sent this out in an e-blast, but you know, so many uh, 
emails have been sent about resources for distance learning, but I'm going to plug a specific one. Um, and it's uh, one, one of our, one of our, our, our members uh, has created this website. Um, it's called shed the music. And I put a link in the comments of the, uh, of the video feed here. Um, but they actually have a whole set of free transcription resources that are available to educators. They, uh, they list a bunch of solos and sort of their different scaffolding levels of difficulty. They also provide a guided lead sheet, which shows the beginnings and the ends of the soloist phrase to help beginning students, you know, look at the range of the solo and then write the notes in. They're also currently offering free transcription video course. If you don't teach transcription or haven't taught transcription, you can have your students watch this and it gives them the basics of beginning to transcribe by ear. So I'll bounce some of these solos off you, Ryan. These are the ones that are listed on the site. Level one, the first one is Miles Davis on So What? <laughs> Um, level uh, also Chet Baker on it could happen to you a number of people pointed out in the comments uh, yeah. that Chet's, Chet's a, a very melodic player as a jury um, mulligan would also fall into that category Dexter Gordon on watermelon man hmm. uh, Miles Davis on trains blues and then it jumps up level two uh, and we've got uh, Grant Green on blues for Juanita JJ Johnson as you mentioned on Groovin. Hmm. Um, and then level three moves up to like Charlie Parker on perhaps or Lee Morgan on Ciora things yeah. that have more harmonic alteration and are a little bit more technically challenging. Hmm. Uh, but check that, check that resource out, uh, shed the some hmm. good transcription resources for directors who kind of want to get started, uh, but may not have the materials ready to go. Uh, all right. Uh, another question. Um, and I think this is a great one for educators and a lot of people have posed this one. Um, could you maybe share some of your specific assessment methods? You mentioned having students send in MP3s or recordings of their playing and also um, assessing them, you know, live in, in the setting on Zoom. Um, but for teachers who are maybe asked, you know, uh, teaching high school or middle school or college as well, but to provide like concrete assessment methods, perhaps for their administration and, and ways of assessing in this new paradigm. Could you maybe offer some suggestions there? Yeah, I, I wish I had more concrete ideas. I, I will say that we're as a department literally just now um, discussing uh, when it comes to time for juries and assessments to greatly relax uh, what we generally ask about from our students. I mean, um, and this might be something more specific to New York, but students right now are, are so stressed and dealing with so many things that we can't even begin to comprehend. Um, and every student has such a unique situation that they're personally dealing with that we're, we're looking to assess basically as little as possible. For me right now, the assessment really ends at, are they engaged? Are they showing up to our Zoom meetings? Are they submitting their recordings? If not, are they telling me why they're not submitting their recordings? Um, are they at the very least just in, you know, communicating with me via, via email? That kind of for me and for, through the end of this semester is, is where I'm leaving it. And uh, come the fall, if we're still dealing with this, I'll, I'll probably have better ideas and, and more concrete ideas. But for now, we're really, um, we're really just trying to encourage our students to, to, to stay engaged, however that looks for them. Thank you. Um, back to the ear training and listening piece. Um, you mentioned having students learn another part in, in, in sort of the rehearsal process so that they be, begin to be attuned to the harmony that's perhaps beneath them. Say they're playing a first alto, they, they wanna be able to hear the voicing of the second tenor, for mm. example. Um, do you, how do you do, how would you recommend that be done um, do you do you want students to listen to those parts? Do you have them record them for one another? Are you transposing parts and sending them to the other students so that they you know they could learn? Are you asking them to do that part by ear? Uh, right. You know, maybe some method for that. So for me, generally, I wouldn't ask even a more advanced student to learn an inner voicing. That's really hard to do. I mean, I, I made a kind of one of my jobs early in my freelance career was editing all the big band charts for essentially Ellington, uh, all the, their publications. And I know 
personally how difficult it is to hear inner voices, even on super, super structured logical arrangements uh, that, that Duke would usually create. So I probably wouldn't get into inner parts for horn players, but what I would do and what I was specifically thinking of and referring to was having horn players learn rhythm section parts and specifically bass parts since they're also single note melodies for the most part, or maybe even learn drum parts. And that would be something I'd probably have them play on their instrument but vocalize the ride cymbal rhythm. And then you could play that on an instrument just on one note. Vocalize the ride cymbal rhythm, vocalize the tom accents, um, vocalize the comping rhythm of the piano. You know, that's something that is absolutely possible for everyone to do. And again, especially for horn players, it gets them outside of that, of that aural um, focus of listening to other horns. That was really the, the primary um, crux behind that, behind that um, exercise. But I will add, you gave me an idea. I mean, we're all just constantly learning here. With the recording sound trap, once you've got your band uh, uh, to upload all their individual parts and you've got this multi-track recording up there, you could now just solo the second tenor part. And that's really fun. I mean, that's fun for everyone, including, including the director, to hear just the second tenor part for a whole entire section uh, by some, you know, master arranger. I'd love to just listen to the second alto part of a, of a Sammy Nestigo chart, you know, that would be extremely informative. Um, not necessarily from an ear training exercise, but from an arranging exercise, from a counter melody construction approach. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's an interesting soundtrack would allow us to really isolate the different parts in that way. I'm going to follow up on that. We had a good question come over the chat here from Duran Thomas, and he asked, so he's trying to put together tunes for a rehearsal performance, I think. I don't know if he's doing it virtually or eventually performing live, but he is asking, how would you recommend going about that without using? Say that one more time, without using what? I lost you in the final. Well, without using Zoom. Okay. Well, this is kind of where we started. Uh, originally, we were, when we went into this lockdown, um, we were working on a set of tunes, much like uh, he is with his group. And I just started assigning excerpts, the hard, generally the hardest parts of the arrangement, you know, so letters, uh, you know, L and M for the saxophones, letters O and P for the brass, uh, just the head in for the rhythm section. And then I had them record themselves and, and email them to me. And then I would listen to each of them and provide feedback, extremely time uh, consuming. And uh, my students, even more advanced college students found it to be quite difficult to play music by themselves with a metronome without the rhythm section providing you with the groove and the kind of just uh, musical cushion that we're all so used to to sitting on and to utilizing for support both harmonically and rhythmically it is really challenging to do that especially i would imagine for high school or even younger students um, or less experienced college students to just jump in and lay down their parts with the metronome is extremely daunting um, because a lot of it also is just how do you record yourself while you're listening to a metronome again getting into this idea of listening to something while you play and record something it's it's not easy you have to there's a lot of trial and error there and every person has to kind of figure out how it works for them given their own technological limitations so i would say you know try to do that but you might find that there are sections that it's just really, really hard to get your students to master without being in a room together, unfortunately. And uh, I found Soundtrap to help with that though, because as other parts started to appear, some of those students who were having trouble, now they could listen to their peers as they laid down their own track, right? Because as the, as the Soundtrap uh, program is populated with everyone else's parts, you can download an updated version. And now when you're listening to your play along, you're now hearing all the other sax parts or all the other horn parts, or at the very least you're hearing a rhythm section part. I always start with my rhythm section uploading their parts first. That's a great suggestion. Uh, a couple more questions that I think touch on some larger areas that people are asking about. Um, and then we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, 
ear training. And I think specifically the questions are coming over about actual focus, not on listening exercises, although of course one can say that's ear training as well, but, you know, training the ear, intonation, tuning, those types of things. Are there any uh, resources you're using now or suggestions you have for uh, directors who have large ensembles who want their students to focus on that aspect of musicianship while they're at home? Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but for me, ear training is only listening. That's all it is. Because if you're talking about improving a student's ability to play in tune, yes, there's a technical side to that. And that's what their private teachers are working on with them. That's what you're working on with them if you're in a room with them together. But their intonation will only get better completely regardless of their ability on their instrument until they hear what in tune is. Everyone hears different levels of intonation. I have perfect pitch. I'm extremely lucky to have that. And I'm hearing levels of intonation that a lot of my professional peers don't even hear. Everyone hears things differently, everyone. And so to get students to hear what intonation really means, that all starts with their ability to listen uh, in more focused ways, in more detailed ways, in a heightened sense of aural experience. And so right now, no, we're not actively working on this kind of measured ability for them to play in tune, but it would be very hard to do that anyways. I mean, there are definitely online um, programs and websites that will, that kind of are ear training programs for students, uh, to, you know, to give a, given a pitch and then singing those pitches back, et cetera. Um, I don't, I don't have them off the top of my head, but for me right now, because this is hopefully, fingers crossed, a temporary situation we're dealing with. I'm really trying to use it as an opportunity to improve my students' ability to listen. And I can guarantee you when we do reconvene, my band's going to be more in tune. I would put a lot of money on that fact. <laughs> All right. So last question, and you just touched on it. Um, what are you looking forward to the most when you do get to reconvene with your group? You know, it's interesting, besides the obvious, the obvious just the sense of community and, and the, just making music together. I mean, what this has done, even for our students who are so dependent upon technology and upon, upon um, interacting over the internet, what it has done, it has showed us very loudly and clearly just how how crappy it is <laughs> to make money virtually, I mean, to make music virtually. Um, so I think just aside from the obvious facts of just that, how, much, how much more fun it is to be in a room together, I'm actually looking forward to utilizing some of these technological um, uh, innovations that I've discovered, um, like Soundtrap in particular. I'm going to continue to use Soundtrap because I have found that my students are more apt to practice their parts when they can upload them to a, to a, to a recording program than they are when it means just coming to ensemble and playing uh, within a group. I think it's easier to hide as well when they're in a group in a live setting. Um, and when you're uploading a track to a, pro, a recording program, you know, people can, including their fellow students, can solo their tracks and can hear what they're doing. And that really puts the pressure on them to, to work a little bit harder, to pay a little bit more attention to the details. Great advice, great information, Ryan. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, before we sign off here, please uh, check us out on the web at jazzednet.org, Jazz Education Network. Uh, please consider joining our community of jazz educators, performers, enthusiasts, music business. Uh, we offer a lot of great membership benefits. If you're a director, you get uh, four free charts right now just for joining us. And we're gonna continue to be producing these live events um, and bringing you the types of uh, information you need, especially right now. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Ryan. Um, and if pleasure. you, yeah, yeah we really appreciate it. Um, we do have a handout. Uh, so if you want to make sure that you receive that, there is a link in the description of the video that'll allow you to just register and we will send that follow up information out as soon as we have that together. This video will be here on our Facebook page if you'd like to watch it again. Thanks, Ryan. My pleasure. Thanks for joining right. us, everyone. And, and make sure you sign up for Jen's newsletter. Join, become a member. They are doing great things, have been doing great things for many, many years. And I think we need them now more than ever, helping kind of create a community at a time when, when that is extremely hard to do and hard to find.